When gunpowder arrived in Europe in the 15th century, it began a process that was to change the social structures that dominated the continent completely. The power of cannon to undo the stone walls of towns and fortifications removed the need for the noble classes to maintain them, as power became increasingly centralised through the only men who could afford to maintain armies equipped with the latest technology. Kings Armies equipped with gunpowder weapons had a vastly different bearing to those that preceded them. Artillery was of ever-increasing importance, whilst cavalry became far more sidelined. The matchlock musket, when it appeared in 1521, ensured that the gradual changes already occurring were cemented. The early muskets were clumsy and slow to load and fire, but it was easy to train a man in their use. An English longbowman, for example, could engage an enemy at over three times the range of an early musket, but his craft took a lifetime of training to mask the. A musketeer, by contrast, could be ready to fight within hours of first picking up his weapon. The European states were quick to adopt the musket, but so rapid was the change in army composition that much work was needed to develop a matching doctrine. The vulnerability of musketeers to attack by cavalry and melee forces was obvious, and most armies fielded mixed units of musket and pike to ensure that cavalry would not run amok through their infantry. It was the Spanish that developed the system that was to dominate this style of warfare. During the Italian wars in the late 15th and early 16th century, the great captain Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba developed a system of deploying his troops in huge blocks of two to three thousand men, with a third armed with muskets and the rest with pike, in formations known as tercios. The tercio was far too enormous to be practical as comparatively few musketeers were able to fire at the enemy at any one time, and the huge formation could never respond to battlefield situations quickly. But the sight alone of such an immense formation would have had a formidable effect upon the morale of an enemy, particularly one inexperienced in battle. The power of the tercio had truly broken the ability of cavalry to act as shock troops. The armoured knight had already been driven from the battlefield by the arrival of guns, and the vast blocks of troops, backed up by pikes, were no longer vulnerable to a sudden charge. The Spanish were to thus re-equip their cavalry with wheel-lock pistols, which their horsemen would just discharge into blocks of enemy troops before withdrawing to reload, before then trotting back to fire again. The loss of shock value, combined with the short range of their pistols, rendered cavalry an extremely ineffectual force on battlefields at this time. As the 16th century wore on, cannon became more reliable and mobile, and thus became more prevalent on the battlefields of the time. This was to spell trouble for the tercio, as such a vast block of men was incredibly vulnerable to attack by artillery. The Spanish attempted to reduce the size of their formations accordingly, but were unwilling to field tercios less than ten ranks deep. This, they believed, was the minimum depth of formation necessary for the caracol order of firing, by which the front rank of musketeers would fire and then retreat to the rear of the formations to reload their clumsy weapons as the next rank stepped up to fire in turn. Spanish tactics as a whole were cumbersome and methodical, but enjoyed a great deal of success due to the lack of determined opposition they faced. The Spanish were one of a very few states in the 16th century to maintain a semi-professional army, itself in part a product of de Cordoba's influence. Most other contemporaries relied upon mercenary bands or poorly trained forces who crumbled in the face of determined Spanish professionals. As Machiavelli wrote of mercenaries in 1513, He who holds his state by means of mercenary troops can never be solidly or securely seated for such troops are disunited, ambitious, insubordinate, treacherous, insolent among friends, cowardly before foes, and without fear of God or faith with man. Whenever they are attacked, defeat follows, so that in peace you are plundered by them, in war by your enemies. I ought to have little difficulty in getting this believed, for the present ruin of Italy is due to no other cause than her having for many years trusted to mercenaries. Mercenaries had indeed been the undoing of many an Italian state, to the staggering advantage of Spain. 
In the late 1580s, however, the domination of the Spanish over continental land warfare was to be broken. The Dutch revolt had begun in earnest after the humbling of Spain through the debacle of the Spanish Armada, but the Spanish armies were still a force to be reckoned with. In the face of their powerful foe, the Dutch leaders, Prince Maurice of Orange and his cousin, William Louis of Nassau, embarked upon a campaign to create a strong, professional army with which to liberate their country. The Dutchmen had obtained a copy of the Byzantine Tactica that Emperor Leo the Wise had penned over 600 years earlier, emphasising the need for discipline and drill for military success. These maxims formed a strong foundation upon which to build their new force. It was in the Dutch formations that obvious changes appeared. Men were deployed only five or six ranks deep, enabling a far greater flexibility, whilst they wielded far more muskets than pikes, with two-thirds of men having guns. By this reorganisation the Dutch could still field a comparable amount of fire, despite a smaller formation, though the men still fired in caracol. The Dutch also created the world's first professional officer corps, men trained in leadership, with specific duties within the hierarchy and with a direct responsibility to their ruler. By these changes, the Dutch created a revolutionary armed force, more dependable than most European armies and far more flexible. Their victories over the Spanish more or less created the Dutch borders that persist to this day and allowed the Dutch Republic to develop in relative safety. The Dutch successes were numerous and unsurprisingly attracted much attention. Many officers that were to fight in the English Civil War, for example, learned their trade from Prince Maurice. But one such student was to build upon the lessons of the Dutch and lead some of the most stunning battlefield victories ever achieved in Europe. The future King of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus. King Gustavus Adolphus achieved his great battlefield successes through what Bevan Alexander, upon whose work I have greatly based this video, referred to as the principle of employing superior weapons. Gustavus was quick to recognise that the Dutch had achieved their successes through exploiting the inherent inflexibility of the Spanish way of war. The vast tercio formations were slow and cumbersome, and vulnerable to attack by more mobile forces. The newly developed wheel-lock musket was the first weapon that could aid in this goal. Being lighter, quicker to load, and lacking the need for a crutch, this weapon greatly enhanced the firepower of his infantry, whilst the creation of more mobile light artillery meant that Gustavus could provide close fire support to his men on the battlefield. To maximise the effectiveness of the new muskets, Gustavus eliminated the caracol system of fire and instead formed his men into shorter formations a mere three ranks deep when facing the enemy. This made his men far less vulnerable to artillery fire, whilst their shorter weapons meant that all three ranks could fire at the same time. The Swedish salve, as this was to be known, would have been a terrifying attack to endure, and was to prove extremely effective at shattering opposing forces. In essence, the firepower of each formation was triple that of the tercio. The developments in Swedish artillery were just as effective. Barrels were shortened and carriages lightened, whilst calibres of gun were standardised, making all types of gun easier to support logistically and use on the battlefield. The greatest step forward, however, was the creation of the light four-pounder. These guns were developed with the specific task of supporting infantry. Two were deployed alongside every regiment and were loaded with canister ammunition. These guns were pulled up alongside infantry regiments and sprayed four pounds of metal pellets and fragments from wooden cases into the unfortunate enemies before them. The wooden cases and light construction of the guns meant that they could fire eight canisters in the time the infantry could fire six shots, granting them a phenomenal destructive potential, particularly against enemies deployed in the outmoded tercio formation. Gustavus also restored the shock value of his cavalry, ordering them to rely upon their swords once more and engage the enemy at a gallop in order to break scattered enemy formations. Naturally, these developments did not simply appear overnight. When Gustavus ascended the throne of Sweden in 1611, he inherited three wars – against Denmark, Russia and Poland. The war with Denmark was concluded in 1613 after little fighting of import. 
Russia made peace in 1617 after a more lengthy campaign, which concluded with the province of Ingria in Swedish hands and Russia expelled from the Baltic. The war with Poland lasted the longest and was the testing ground for many of Gustavus's military innovations. Aggressive use of cavalry by the Poles was a particular influence upon future Swedish engagements. Gustavus himself was wounded several times in the lengthy campaigns in Poland, and the two sides both enjoyed their share of successes. The eventual peace, signed in 1629, granted Sweden considerable territorial gains, including the ports of Danzig and Königsberg. But events beyond the Polish border were about to overtake the young Swedish king and would draw him into the war that would show the world the brilliance of his tactics and grant Sweden her chance at eternal fame.